we are here today to dip into the brain and the research of Harvard psychologist, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hull, who I will introduce in just a moment. And we're going to talk about building productivity and well being within modern organizations. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Tom Finn, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our discussion today. I'll be your moderator, uh, but my day job consists of leading a career health employee benefits company named Leg Up, where we work to unlock the potential of employees previously unavailable to HR and talent leaders. Now, I'm here to guide the discussion today as our mission and research at Leg Up ties very closely into building resilient workforces. There's two things I'd like you to think through as we start to unpack some of this information. First and foremost, the employer view. Uh, we're finding that the number one challenge for CEOs is to help their remote teams work well together. And all of our friends in HR uh, are, are really focused on employee engagement. That's the number one concern of HR folks this year. So that's our employer view. Let's compare and contrast that to our employee population. For the first time in history, career growth opportunities rank as the number one most important factor when employees are looking for a new role at a new employer at 61%. Now, this topples our longtime friends of healthcare and retirement and compensation. So this is a big a seismic shift in employee demands from employer groups. Now, these two paths intersect uh, very seamlessly in culture and productivity and health and resilience and alignment uh, to really perform at a high level for organizations through their talent base. Now, you may ask yourself, why did you create a relationship with Jeff? And I think you're going to find today that his insights and research are incredibly valuable. We're going to deconstruct how the best organizations perform and how to build that into your 2021 plan. So without further ado, allow me to introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Hull. Uh, Dr. Hull is a PhD and BCC and CEO of Leadership Inc. As a leadership development uh, consultancy based in New York City, and he is the author of a fabulous book, Flex, The Art and Science of Leadership in a Changing World. He's a highly sought after speaker, consultant, and coach with over 25 years working with C-suite leaders worldwide. Dr. Hull is also a clinical instructor in psychology at Harvard Medical School. He's an adjunct professor of leadership at the New York at New York University, and he is the director of education at the Institute of Coaching, which is a Harvard Medical School affiliate. So let me be the first to say welcome, Jeff. We're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you, Tom. It's thrilling to be here. I'm excited to be with you. Terrific, Jeff. Well, maybe I'll start with just a quick um, overview of our agenda, and then I'm going to hand it to you to walk everybody through some of your research. So we're working on welcome and introductions currently. We're going to move right into our current research on productivity and well-being. And we're going to spend most of our time in the fireside chat today. We'll walk through nurturing, engaged, high-performing millennials and Gen Zs. I think there's some interesting research there that we're going to unpack. We're going to look at targeted support for multi-generational teaming and, of course, developing resilient managers in 2021. So, Jeff, I'm going to hand it to you to get into your current research. Thank you, Tom, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for having me. I am excited to be part of this conversation and thrilled to be part of what you and your folks at Leg Up are creating, uh, particularly in today's world where you know, there's an even greater need to focus on support and growth for uh, the next generation of leaders and for organizations that are obviously, like the rest of us, going through what has been a very disruptive uh, last year or so. So when you asked me to come and talk a little bit about the research behind productivity and well-being, I think the very first thing I shared with you, um, if you remember, is that to my mind, it is really kind of a false dichotomy. Um, you know, you can have a lot of productivity and have a lot of burnt out folks, or you can have a lot of really well-being people that are super healthy that are not particularly productive. And it, the key really is not one or the other, but both. And I think before we dive into what some of the research is showing 
um, around how to leverage both of these in today's organizations, it's, it's helpful to step back and kind of look at some of the more, what I would call foundational themes that have been around for a while, but are really core to um, making sure that we understand the psychology and the basic fundamental principles of what it takes to be highly productive and healthy and well be and have well-being in today's world. So I always like to start with this slide um, that reminds us of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And many of us are familiar with this. It's been around for 20, 25 years. But the core of it is really still quite relevant to today. And that is just to keep in mind that as human beings, whether it's teams, individuals, organizations, it's really Im impossible to be productive or to have high levels of well-being if you don't start with the foundations. And the foundations are physiological needs, needs like security and nutrition and sleep and health, right? And we've all been, you know, experiencing what, what it can mean this past year with a pandemic that, you know, we've been sort of thrown back on our ankles and our back on our heels, recognizing that we have to get back to the core of taking care of ourselves before we can jump way up high into things like self-actualization or creativity. So it's just important to keep this in mind that productivity and well-being are founded on really core premise of human needs, which are physiological needs, needs for safety, needs for what he called love and belonging. I would add community, you know, a need, a need for social cohesion in an age of what we're calling social distancing. I've always hated that phrase because I think it's really, really more physical distancing. But regardless, you know, so social cohesion and community is really important. Before you get up to high productivity and creativity, you need all of those things as foundations. And then when we think about well-being and productivity, you can't have a conversation, you can't look at the research around these topics without stepping back and thinking about stress. Because at the end of the day, the environment that we all work in and live in can be incredibly stressful. I mean, think about frontline healthcare workers, the level of stress that they've had to endure this past year is probably something that hopefully none of them would ever have to deal with again. But even in regular organizations, typical you know, tech or um, healthcare or regular organ corporate organizations or startups, the level of stress from having to go from office work to virtual work, from having to uh, be able to travel to not being able to travel, Many small businesses, as we know, have been really hurt by what we've all gone through this past year. So the level of stress that everyone has been experiencing has definitely been heightened. And that brings us to the question of how do you mitigate and manage stress? And the key here is to keep in mind that not all stress is bad. It's sort of an ironic paradox to start us off, but we need to keep in mind that it's not about having no stress. It's not about having a stress-free existence that creates well-being and high productivity. It's really about finding that equilibrium or that balance for peak performance between stress that leads to burnout or that leads to what we see here on this chart, fuzzy-mindedness, exhaustion, irritability, anxiety, or the stress that actually motivates us, that keeps us energized. So it's not an either or proposition. And it's really important that we reflect on ourselves as leaders, we reflect for our teams on what is the balance we're shooting for in terms of optimal stress management, not having no stress and not having too much stress. And that's key to both productivity and well-being. And then just briefly to dive into some of the research around this exact theme, you know, optimizing productivity, optimizing well-being. Um, my colleague Fred Luthens um, at the University of Nebraska has done substantial studies around the use of positive psychology frames and assessments to look at what makes teams hum, what makes an organizational environment lead to real high 
productivity and also this balanced stress, right, where people are able to move to the higher level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They're able to find that equilibrium between too much stress and not enough. And this simple framework is a result of that research. And I love this because it simplifies what's really rigorous evidence-based research based on surveys that were developed and validated and used in hundreds of organizations. And it's been summarized in a model that he calls the hero model. And it's basically, again, kind of pulling apart these core themes of productivity and well-being and look at what the core components are that we as leaders or learning officers or HR folks need to be thinking about in order to build this capability in our teams. And it starts with hope, which is really, you know, a euphemism for realistic optimism. And the thing you want to be keeping in mind here is that it's future oriented and it's grounded and realistic. And so the mindset of the folks on your team need to develop a sense of realistic, you know, we get that this is difficult, we get that we're under stress, but we are optimistic. We're willing and able to move in the direction of um, positive reframing. And that leads to the next dimension, which is really core to both productivity and well being, which is efficacy. It's been shown in a number of studies that when people feel a sense of competence, they feel like they are not only capable, but they're confident. They have a sense of autonomy. They're not full of themselves. They retain a level of humility, which allows continued learning. But within those confines of efficacy, you find that people operate in optimal ways. So you have realistic optimism, you have confidence and competence, and then you have resilience. And there's been a lot of discussion around this in the last year because we've all been kind of bouncing back from a very difficult dynamic. And the key here is bouncing back through connection. As I said earlier, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have social cohesion, you have community, you have a sense of relatedness, it's core to people feeling that they can move through difficult times, bounce back, and move back into a high-performing capability. So collaboration, and also some of the positive psychology frames that have been shown to be incredibly powerful, like gratitude and compassion. And these are sort of soft skills as we think about them. You know, it's great to have compassion, it's great to be grateful, but research has shown that just taking a little extra time to experience, express, and actually feel grateful for what's working. What I like to call looking for the silver linings makes a huge difference in the way that people view their environment, their day, and ultimately catalyzes performance. And then finally, that leads to, as you would imagine, optimism. Seeing the future as what's possible, but being realistic and planning. So this is a wonderful frame that is deeply research-based around a great deal, a number of assessments around how we can optimize productivity and well-being. And then moving into a context that we wanted to talk about today, which is thinking about the generational teaming that organizations are experiencing. You know, we know we hear a lot about demographic differences, and there's a lot of um, discussion and sometimes conflict around whether or not there are fundamental differences between di between generations, whether the workplace is really shifting and changing for the next generations. But some of the research really does show that the value systems and the priorities of the next generations coming up have fundamentally started to change. And it's really important that we think about how to leverage, how to optimize so that those next generation of leaders, those folks that are stepping into project management roles or their first professional roles are actually feeling like they are being heard. They're getting their needs met. So you can see on this slide, I'm not gonna take the time to go through this entire slide, but you can see the kinds of themes that come up around millennials, generation Y and generational Z values. They tend to wanna be creative. They want to have meaningful work. They tend to care a great deal about the culture of the environment that they work in, the purpose, the values. They, they reflect on whether or not what they're doing in the world is in alignment with the organization that they work for. And that becomes really crucial when you think about multi-generational teaming. 
And by that, we're, what I mean is when you have like baby boomers or traditionalists working directly with millennials or Generation Z folks or even younger, you know, they might have mentees. And it's really important to have a frame of reference so that we can come together and be collaborative and learn from each other. And we'll get to that in a little bit in the next slide. But these are some of the examples of what the research has shown really does work. So thinking about working with these generations through mentoring, coaching, and emphasis on feedback and learning. So feedback loops, flexibility, you know, interestingly enough, a couple of years ago, you know, flexible workplace, flexible hours was kind of a newfangled idea, and some companies were experimenting with it. Well, needless to say, I think we've all had to become flexible. And, you know, having a flexible work hours or workplace where people are now working virtually, it's just almost become the norm. But it actually plays well for these generations. It can be more challenging for those of us who grew up, you know, in our traditional office environments. But what's key to success and to, again, leveraging high productivity and well-being is keeping in mind that the next generations are comfortable. They want this kind of flexibility. And they're technically savvy. They want to communicate in multiple platforms, as we know. They want to use social media. They want to use texting. They want to use email. They do not want to be confined. And that can be sometimes challenging for different team dynamics. But the plus side of that is that the next generations tend to be very team oriented. They may be individually achievement oriented, but they recognize and are interested and are committed to success with project teams. So leveraging teamwork is really important in the development of this generation. And then finally, it's really important to give them a voice, to give them an opportunity to lead. And we're gonna talk about some of the research that I did when I wrote my book, which which led me to sort of reframe what does it even mean to develop leaders in today's world. But one thing we want to keep in mind before we get to that is that one of the shifts that we're seeing in the organizational landscape is that the entire organizational framework is fundamentally changing. It's becoming much more around connectivity and networking and less about pyramid. Um, my friends at Leg Up created this chart for me, and I'm really grateful because Tom's team put together a beautiful picture, picture in a sense, of what's happening within organizations. You know, many of our very large companies still have pyramids, and there's still people at the top, and there's still a C-suite, and there's still, you know, a hierarchy. But that is changing. That's evolving. The companies that are really quick that are really able to work with through disruptions, who are highly innovative and competitive, are, are recognizing that the hierarchy can actually be an obstacle to success. That as we integrate the next generation, we need to take advantage of networking, technology that is, creates greater connectivity. And that leads to themes like belonging and inclusion that are crucial for flattening the hierarchy and bringing organizations together so that people feel like they're actually working as part of something important, no matter what level they are in the organization. And it puts a great deal of pressure or strain on what it means to be a leader, because just working from the top down is no longer going to be really effective with the kinds of generational issues that I've just been talking about. And also, you have to think about multicultural and multiracial environments. So that's where belonging, inclusion, and diversity becomes really important. And key to the success of, the, of those environments as they get flatter, as they are more networked, is creating a coaching culture, one that is foundationally built on a learning mindset. And we're going to talk a little more about that. I give an example here on the final part of this slide, talking about mentoring, which is key. And mentoring is a form of coaching. It's support function to develop the next generation of leaders. And then there are a number of really good leading edge organizations that are actually doing reverse mentoring, where they have the tech savvy social media mavens that are maybe in their mid 20s, actually showing some of the more senior people how to leverage technology. And then they learn from each other, which can be really powerful. The Hartford Insurance Company, which I read about in my book, is an example, a real life case where with the CLO and the head of HR, they developed a reverse mentoring program that was incredibly successful. So that's just a taste of the kind of thing that you can create in your organization. 
And along those lines, when I did my research for my book that Tom mentioned, Flex, what I did is I went out with my colleagues at the Institute of Coaching at Harvard, and I took a look at what executive coaches are working on these days. How has it evolved over the last five to 10 years? And these are just some of the quick takeaways from the research. There's a lot more behind this, but just some of the key themes that came up. Number one was that leaders are being asked to do what I call push to pull leadership. And when you move away from a directive to a collaborative style in your leadership, one of the very first things you do is less telling and more listening, more inquiry, more dialogue. And that can be challenging because it takes time. It's more inclusive, but it gets great ideas generated. It's highly innovative. A second theme that emerged was that leaders are being asked to pay attention to the individual goals of the employees. And this is also sometimes challenging. Like we have our vision for the company. We have our vision for the organization. We have our marching orders. So everybody, everybody should just get in step. Well, yes and no. If you really want to leverage the capabilities, the productivity and the well-being of your staff, then you need to take the time to get the people that work in your organization in alignment with your goals, with their goals, and be committed to working both ends of the spectrum. We are successful as an organization if you're successful as an employee. And you do that through the third bullet, which is creating feedback loops, making sure that as a leader, you're getting constant upward circular feedback to know what's working so that you have a learning mindset yourself and then you become a role model for that for your staff. And one of the ways we do that is creating peer-to-peer -peer networks. Again, this all folds together to this theme that organizations are becoming more networked and less hierarchical. And peer-to-peer -peer networks, research has shown that what motivates people more than any other thing in life, surprisingly, is not your boss. It's your coworker. It's your colleague. It's your teammate. They're your, they're your best coach at times because they have your best interests in mind, but they're also a little bit competitive with you. And if you can leverage that, you can create peer-to-peer -peer networks that get the best out of everyone. So here's one last couple more slides for you before we move into a chat with Tom. And I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, but I wanted to share this as just a reference point for how far the profession of coaching has come in the last 15, 10 to 15 years. You know, when I first started doing executive coaching, it was mostly remedial, like bring in the psychologist to see if we can get this guy to behave. And it usually was a guy. Um, we've changed a lot since then. <clears throat> there are still those situations where you have leaders who have uh, behaviorals that need to be changed or, you know, they need to be, become more, be, be changing their communication style, become more respectful, all of which is still relevant. But the science behind developing high performing leaders has evolved such that it's no longer just a good, a nice to have to develop people through coaching. It's really been shown through all of these areas that are shown on this screen that working with people through a coaching modality, whether it's peer coaching, regular leadership coaching, team coaching, whatever form is possible in your organization, using these scientific underpinnings has really demonstrated that that is one of the key ways that people grow and become more productive and continually foster a learning mindset throughout their entire career. So you can just see, you know, positive psychology, appreciative inquiry, strengths-based theories, positivity, Barbara Fredrickson's work on re research in positive